I'd like to introduce Helen. So we've been talking probably for, I don't know how long you've been in touch with FNS now for, six months, a year, something like that. I can't quite remember. I, I feels a while ago now, yeah. <laughs> so we've been, been uh, chatting backwards and forwards, I think, for some little time. And um, certainly Scott and I recognised how important it was actually to discuss um suicide during the perinatal period for men because there's so little research on it uh, and so little data so when Helen got in touch and had told us about not only our story but also about the work that she'd been doing um, researching this um, this topic we absolutely jumped at the chance of having her coming um, to tell us more about what she'd learned and her own experiences and why it's so critical to to talk about it so thank you so much for taking the time to come along and um and talk about what you've been doing research wise and also about your ex your personal experiences um and without on that note i think i'm going to pass over to you helen and you can take over perfect thank you so much kathy and again thank you so much for having me here and giving me this opportunity I'm overwhelmed and super excited and blown away by how many people are here. Um, but I really hope it kind of shows testament to how much we want to do. And we are really starting to recognise that uh, fathers in the perinatal period need and deserve much more attention. So I shall share my slides and then I shall start uh, introducing and going through both my story, personal story, and also my research. So um, as Kathy said, my name's Helen Birch, um, and uh, I've recently completed a master's uh, degree in mental health recovery and social inclusion, which I passed with honours, which um, is quite blown me away because it's the only degree, uh, master's you can do, sorry, without any previous degrees. So I joined this through my lived experience. I barely had a GCSE. Now, my ver as, as with master's, uh, time for research is very short, very limited. So my research was virtual in nature. Um, so uh, 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 more of a proposal or a hypothesis, I suppose. But my topic um, was exploring maternal experiences of the perinatal period following paternal suicide through photo voice. During this research, it became incredibly clear that we really have a long way to go to look after our fathers during this period. So how did I come to this and why did I join this Masters? Well, my journey started, it will be 12 years ago now. Um, so me and my partner um, were together and we both had previous children and we wanted to cement our relationship and have our own children within that relationship. So we were lucky enough to fall pregnant um, quite easily, quite quickly, um, you know, all excited. It had been a long time for both of us. And then sadly, we suffered a missed miscarriage. Now, I was cared for really, really well. Um, and at the time, I didn't realise what was not happening for my partner, what was not being said to my partner. It wasn't until much later, you know, that, that hindsight, which is not a wonderful thing. I think it's, a, you know, it can be a really devastating thing. But we continued. So we thought, you know, we'll try again. So we got pregnant and we had a no complications pregnancy and birth. And we've got our beautiful boy who is going to be 10 this year. I can't believe that. And um, again, I was looked after beautifully. And again, I had no reason or no recognition as to what was not being said to my partner, what was not being done to support my partner. Um, and then we thought, this is great. We'll have another child. So uh, we got pregnant again. And we suffered a massive uh, bleed very early on in the pregnancy. We went to the doctors where we were told we had lost the baby. They weren't going to do a scan because they knew what we'd see. Um, I, I kind of had a feeling that I was still pregnant, though. But, you know, you, you kind of trust in the professionals. So, again, we thought we had lost another child. Um, and um, again, you know, the GP was lovely. Uh, uh, but again, I, you know, I didn't know what was not said to my partner. Um, so uh, after a couple of weeks, we had the blood test for human growth hormone. It was seen to be rising. I was sent for a scan. There was a beautiful heartbeat and a beautiful fetus. Happy, excited, you know, all of these lovely things. 
two weeks later, my partner was dead. He'd taken his life. Um, and that is what had led me to this. Now, during that journey, how many contacts did we have with services and how many questions were not asked to my partner? How many times was he told he's got to look after me and not asked, how are you, dad? So that is what led me to where I am today. Um, so throughout this, um, throughout this presentation, I will probably use maternity and perinatal interchangeably, just so you know, um, and where you see HCP, I'm referring to healthcare professionals, um, you know, predominantly within maternity services, but obviously any healthcare professional can come in contact with fathers. Now, I do believe and I do know that maternity services are doing an amazing job they really are and that's with the training the resources and the information that they have but they themselves and the families and you know are not getting the training resources or the information that is required to keep the whole family safe um so Throughout this project, um, I utilise research globally, um, so that was read and referenced within my um, within my project. And although um, you know this is more focused within uh, the UK, it is absolutely all relevant and transferable um, across any maternity perinatal services. Poor mental, uh, poor maternal and um, maternal and paternal mental health has been associated with risk factors for poor outcomes in children. So, you know, again, it's really vital that we look into this. Fathers play a hugely important role in a child's development and can affect a child's social competence, performance in school, emotional regulation as well. And fathers can also affect a child's well-being indirectly. A supportive relationship between parents is linked to better self-regulation in the child as well. So we can see, you know, why we should be doing what we are doing here. So introduction and background into um, my research here. So looking at the first point there, paternal suicide during this critical period is still highly stigmatised and under researched. You know, stigmatisation, we will quite often hear the term selfish. How could they do that? How could they leave their children like that? You know, and, and that's due to biases and, and stigma. And, you know, you'll also see within my literature review that that, that huge stark lack of research in this area. Male suicide rates have remained fairly consistent with around 75% of suicides being male. Now, this has been the case for decades, um, you know, and that's despite the plethora of suicide prevention plans, etc. that we have. In Scotland, since 1994, suicide rates among men have been between 2.6, 2.3 times higher than among women. Male suicide rates in Scotland are higher than they are in England and in Wales. And again, this has been a long term trend. So from Enkish 2022, um, it showed that 90 percent of males had had contact with a GP or similar before taking their life. Now, of that 90 percent, only 42 uh, percent, 43 percent, sorry, were seen for issues relating to their mental health. Now, obviously, we don't have the opportunity at the moment to gain this data yet um, for people outside of the mental health system. So the NKISH report focuses on people within the mental health system um, already, whatever level that may be. And because we're not recording that, you know, we're not seeing if that is a trend, something that we could pick up on in our men in general. Now, again, within the NKISH um, report, there's this wonderful statement make every contact count. I'll say that again, make every contact count, wherever that contact occurs. Yet for our fathers, we are not doing that yet. Um, you know, there are so many potential opportunities for contact within maternity. Within my own journey, as you saw, there were many and every single one of those was missed. Thinking about those potential compounding risk factors, uh, you know, from, from losing fathers, um, etc. So we do know that lower education increases risk factors, including suicide. Um, and in Scotland, we can see that women tend to gain higher education degree level, um, that is, and this gap is becoming statistically notable. 
We also know that economic adversity increases many risk factors, again, including suicide. Um, households um, headed by women are more likely to be financial vulnerable, leading to those potential poverty related risks to children. And also child poverty was higher in single parent households. So you can really start seeing things to build, you know, building upon each other then. Then we've got data does not allow us to ascertain how many fathers, how many were fathers all during the perinatal period. So through this lack of data, there is, you know, there's such a high potential for countless paternal suicides not being recorded as perinatal. Um, in addition, you know, these deaths may happen after the mother and baby have been, been discharged from the postnatal checks, maybe at six weeks. We know we've still got a long time within the perinatal period there. Um, then also considering that if fathers are separated from mothers, this again will remove evidence from any of those records. You know, this really highlights the need for better data collection so we can really start to see those numbers and build that picture. And it serves why such research is vital, you know, so we can both gain knowledge potentially through the bereaved partner of what could have potentially have supported uh, uh, the father. Um, um, uh, and in doing so, we'd actually work in a postventive way with the mothers or partners there as well. Um, so then moving on to the next point, which is current research suggests that fathers experience marginalisation. This is then potentially increased by the lack of specific training for healthcare professionals on the engagement of fathers. So health related stigma can be seen as a social process um, or related to personal experience characterised by exclusion, uh, rejection, blame, or that devaluation that results from an experience or that reasonable anticipation of an adverse social judgment about a person or group identified with a particular health problem. So within men, there is that self stigma um, and that can really inhibit help seeking behaviors, possibly due to that conformity of those masculine norms. This stigma is also held by a large faction of healthcare professionals. Um, here's just a, a, a statement from the Burgess and Goldman 2018 from a father. I don't feel like I'm going to be a good father. I don't feel like she wants me around to help me to help raise the baby. I started cutting again a couple of days ago. I haven't done it in so long. And you can really see how that stigma is impacting that father and those feelings. So if we can improve support for fathers, um, especially for those with pre-existing mental health diagnosis, then we can improve the engagement of fathers during this essential transition period, but vitally we can improve the health outcomes. This is for the whole family, isn't it? You know, if we can improve uh, that support uh, and, and look after our fathers, then we're looking after that whole triadic family. We're looking after every member of that family. We're looking, we're looking after the future. And I think that is a really important and vital point there. So more introduction and background. Um, being bereaved by suicide increases your risk of going on to attempt or die by suicide. So you could be met with that desire to join your loved one or, or, or that feeling of not being able to continue to live without them in that state of complicated grief. So being bereaved increases your risk of going on to die by suicide. So for some, this can develop into complicated grief. Now, grief... Um, Grief does not transition from that acute grief, which is the stage after the initial bereavement. The bereaved feels stuck and that intense grief remains and that inhibits life from returning. It, 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 it ceases that person's ability to, to reintegrate. And this is what could be happening to our, our, our women who are bereaved by suicide. I know for me, absolutely. Um, it took a very long time for me to be able to parent um, and to be able to reintegrate in life and the effect it had and it is still having on uh, particularly my daughter because she was seven at the time is huge and we are still under mental health services and this is all stemming back from losing my partner um, you know and I always say 
although my uh, my two boys, um, you know, obviously one was 11 months at the time and I was pregnant with the other one. Um, you know, it hasn't really affected them yet. So I kind of do a bit of an air quote there um, because it, it, it's their normality. It's their life. But, you know, once they hit puberty and those hormones start going around, who knows what they might start experiencing, which stems from the loss of their father through suicide. You know, why wasn't I enough for him to for him to stay, etc. These questions are real. And, you know, we, we, we could be preventing that and looking after our young people. So when looking at the experience of women who have lost a man to suicide, women tend to put the blame on themselves for not supporting the man adequately. Again, this is another, you know, persisting social view uh, and stigma, really, that relates to women in this case, you know, that, that we're the carers. And then this then increases our shame and blame. Um, you know, why couldn't we prevent it? Why didn't we see it? Why weren't we enough? Uh, uh, and this can um, absolutely increase the risk of mental health issues for the woman there. And again, this can lead to potential mental health risks or elevations for the child or children within that situation. So throughout the research, it was seen that supporting the bereaved, if we were working with uh, the mothers, um, that that would absolutely serve as postvention. Um, so therefore, that would be a huge part of prevention going forward. Um, we'd be supporting the mothers, but we'd also be learning through them, learning through the partners of potentially what could have been done to support our fathers better. So men's depression is not often recognised due to men being more likely to externalise their emotions, potentially becoming irritated by their partners and or other close friends, uh, relatives, maybe displaying aggressive behaviour or that increase in alcohol intake. This can all be really wrongly viewed by their closest loved ones, friends and healthcare professionals as well and really lead to potentially dangerous situations maybe relationship breakdown um, and again you know that can increase the risks for child for the child as previously seen um, but also a relationship breakdown is a really high risk factor for males in suicide so we can see you know it just keeps on building and building all these risk factors for our men here um, you know, the, the father may be looked upon as, you know, as, as failing as a father, as a partner, you know, being told to man up, come on, you're going to be a father soon. And this really can increase that hopelessness and helplessness. So the perinatal period can compound feelings of hopelessness as, um, and guilt as well as self-stigma. Now, this in turn can increase depression, suicidal ideation and hopelessness. Now, hopelessness as well as helplessness are known pre-indicators for suicidality. So again, we can really start to see how complex and intertwined this relationship is and all of these factors that are being piled upon our men and not addressed during the perinatal period. So I'm really proud of this picture. I have to say, it took me quite a while. <laughs> I'm not very good at making things neat and tidy. Um, but I really think it's just such a clear visual representation of everything that fathers potentially can experience. Um, well, they do experience. I'm not going to say potentially, actually. I I'm going to, you know, kind of put my foot down here and say that they do experience. So, you know... If we take a look at what fathers are met with and, you know, then become aware of how becoming aware of this can really start to be the start of that recovery of maternity services for our fathers. So as we can see, we've got dad in the middle there and, you know, there he is, proud as he should be. Yet yeah, he's surrounded by all of these words. So first of all, let's look at exclusion. So within the historical context um, of fathers within the perinatal period, men as a whole were barred from the labour process. And this was due to it being seen as no place for a man and singularly relating to the mother and um, her needs. So this did begin to change after the NHS was introduced uh, back in 1948. Um, and then the birth process um, moved from home births to around 70% being medicalised and taking place within hospitals. 
So this really increased feminism towards the medical authorities and patient choices. But it did take until around the 1970s for father's presence to be considered normal um, again. Um, now, yes, of course, we have thankfully seen, um, you know, considerable changes within maternity services in those years preceding that. Yet a paradigm shift, uh, you know, to gain equality and inclusion for men is absolutely still needed. And conversely, um, you know, it could be the feminist views surrounding the maternity services that now really impede that equality um, of, of, of father's needs. So this is just a, a short um, quote from House 2022. Mother and baby are at the heart of everything, with family mere bystanders when it comes to the final push. Then we move on to marginalisation. So fathers are mocked for passing out. We see this. I remember seeing it on one born every minute and you, you hear that joke, oh, you're not going to pass out, are you? Yet in any other walk of life, any other time in somebody's life, when somebody experiences something that shocks their mind and body into them actually losing consciousness, we don't stand there and laugh. Yet our fathers are mocked and laughed at when they pass out because they're going through such a huge transition or ordeal. You know, this is something we really need to think about um, there. So uh, next we have gender prejudice. So man up, you're going to have to look after her. Uh, you know, we see that a lot. And again, that, you know, relating back to my story um, and actually talking to other uh, women when I share my story or my experience, I hear quite often, you know, tragically that, you know, people when they've suffered a miscarriage or etc. The man, the father has been told you're going to have to look after her. Yet nothing is forthcoming for the father. He needs looking after. He's just lost a child. He's just experienced that trauma, you know, and yet there is that gender prejudice. And that goes back to kind of compounding those masculine norms of, you know, broad shoulders and stopping people from reaching out there. We then need to think about microaggressions there. So we really need to recognise the potential harm that has played out within maternity service every day for fathers. Um, this is not deliberate harm at all or maleficence, but microaggressions. So microaggressions, although often unintentional, are absolutely detrimental. And if repeated during these long times of stress, these microaggressions can absolutely impact both physical and mental health. Fathers really experience these along every step of that perinatal journey, um, from having no no uh, no space or chair for fathers during scans, um, or, or or not being addressed during appointments. You know, the, the, those are just to name a few there. Then going on to unsupported. So you might recognise these names, <laughs> especially Kathy Maron Williams, uh, two thousand and twenty two. Um, did a survey of 261 fathers and they found that 22.2% of the fathers were asked about their mental health. This is great. Still a very small number though, isn't it? But this is great. Um, but 71.6% of them were not subsequently offered any signposting. Now, potentially, yes, this is due to lack of paternal signposting knowledge, but it really, really serves to highlight the inequalities that our fathers are facing and the lack of basic training for our healthcare professionals there. Then disempowered. So by excluding fathers during the perinatal period and from that vital information and support relating to their mental health, we are absolutely increasing potential risk factors for paternal suicide. It is well documented that when, um, when the birthing mother has a supportive partner, many of those uh, potential perinatal mental health risk factors are mitigated against. You know, this also serves as protective factors for the infant as well, you know, really vital there. Yet we're still not giving fathers or healthcare professionals the tools to understand the risks and the causes of paternal perinatal mental illness or recognise any signs that they are potentially reaching that crisis point. So my literature review, it was very interesting, um, to say the least. Um, and... Um, 
scary as well at the same point, but this is why I'm so grateful to be here today. So the search term um, was, um, I used the search term and this took a lot of whittling down with the university librarian and my tutor to get this, uh, to get this just right. So uh, the term father or paternal and experience or feeling and suicide or suicidal and perinatal or postnatal, not maternal. Now there you can see the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So must include paternal, must include paternal experience of perinatal experience, must be in English, must be full text, be between 2013 and 23, and must uh, not be highlighting the impact on the mother and or infant. Um, so I searched a number of databases, PubMed, uh, Clinel, uh, Clinel Plus, uh, Mag Online Library, uh, to name a couple. I also did a Google search and I also um, used personally gathered sources as well with regards to that. So what did we find? Well, only 19 to begin with. There were only 19 results to begin with, with that search. And then after the exclusion process and reading, that took me down to four. Now, there was one paper I was aware of. I'm sure many of you may have heard of this paper, Quevedo et al. <clears throat> and I thought this has to be added because this specifically looks at um, suicide of fathers during the postpartum um, period. So I added that paper and that gave me five. Now, that's really quite shocking, isn't it? I got uh, only five papers and actually even only one of those specifically just looks at uh, uh, father's suicide. Um, the others um, were broader, but, you know, did have a focus around that as well. So Quevedo et al um, conducted a longitudinal study from April 07 to May 08. Initially, there were um, just over 700 men. Uh, 56 were excluded because they had experienced previous suicide risks, so that left 650. So this cohort of men incredibly importantly shows, and I think this is a really vital um, piece of information again, that unlike, unlike paternal depression, uh, which does often co-occur with maternal depression, uh, paternal suicide risk during the postpartum period is independent of maternal um, psychopathology. Really important, I think, there. And it's really vital that we consider that Currently within the UK, only fathers whose partners are accessing that specialist perinatal mental health support will be offered any type of support or signposting. So Mare and Williams 2020 asked fathers, are you or did you experience any of the following? Drinking more, feelings of anger, avoiding people and feeling less motivated during this time. 66.3 uh, answered yes. Now, considering that within suicide, um, those who have died by suicide, at least 50% of those had a history of self-harm. Now, yes, I am aware that alcohol falls outside of the NICE guidelines, um, but it can absolutely be viewed as that step towards that ambivalence between life and death. We all know that drinking and an increase in drinking is not good for us, and therefore it is something that we absolutely need to take seriously. Substance abuse can elevate suicide risk and considering that in fathers, an increase in drinking during that perinatal period is linked to depression. Um, Mayor and Williams 2022, again, you know, it really highlights why we need that father specific research, support and healthcare professional training because it is so complex. Um, also, Williams 2020 recommends that um, Inquiries into paternal deaths should absolutely be activated as per the Embrace UK, um, you know, because in that it, 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 it um, highlights causes and outcomes so that policy users can really consider how to prevent and reduce deaths. This would really go some way as well, wouldn't it, to giving us that true picture, which that current lack of data um, recording currently emits. As we cannot ask the experience of those we've already lost to suicide, you know, what was your experience? We can only learn from those who survived an attempt or from the bereaved. You might recognise 
uh, so this journey here, this <laughs> this is from mine, but it's taken from uh, Williams 2020. So there were ample opportunities missed to check on my partner's mental health. In the two years leading up to the suicide, we suffered a miss miscarriage and no complications, pregnancy and birth. And then we suffered a large bleed during our last pregnancy, two weeks before losing my partner. Um, uh, another quote. I didn't seek help initially, even when I knew something was wrong, and this led me to making a number of attempts on my own life. Now, Macmillan 2020 stated, I thought it was normal to struggle the way I did, but then that changed. I remember saying, I don't belong in this world. Now, although it was noted that Macmill Macmillan um, was asked, are you okay, Dad, um, by a healthcare professional, but due to that non-recognition that his feelings were suicide risk factors, this really inhibited those interactions and excluded him from that possible care. Father's care and support needs are really often marginalised um, or ignored, and this is due to their different presentation or la lack of knowledge around this. So thinking back to, um, you know, maybe aggression, maybe drinking, uh, uh, and not recognising that as uh, the depression there. What I have noticed so far is that um, lack of research specifically looking at paternal suicide, you know, and this is possibly due to, but uh, not inclusive, those current statistic recording methods, which do not include this data. And that lack of empirical um, evidence is, is so stark, considering that suicide prevention and postvention is so high on the agenda yet fathers are still not included within policies or strategies. So just briefly, photo voice was the method that I um, chose to use. Um, so in my research, I was really looking at the potential of using photo voice as a means of engaging and, and learning. Um, and, you know, I, I really believe this has potential in many areas, you know, including working with men. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a really highly participatory, as we can see, way of, of sharing experiences. Um, and also Photo Voice has really been seen to impact and raise awareness within clinical and academic institutes institutions, um, communities, policymakers and stakeholders there as well. So I just think it's a really interesting way to engage um, with our, 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 with our um, anyone within maternity services, uh, either maternal or paternal. So photo voice has been seen to increase agency due to its highly participatory methods. Photo voice removes that literacy, language and social barriers, supporting critical dialogue and social change for engagement with excluded communities. This gives way for bottom-up social changes through the shifting dynamics of knowledge generation. Um, and, you know, we can really be impacted by photos, uh, uh, they can really, you know, say a thousand words. Um, so I think it's a really great tool to, to use going forward. Okay, so what have we seen and what have I hopefully highlighted today um, for us? But the need for research within this specific and specialist area of paternal suicide perinatal period. Absolutely, there is a clear lack of inclusion of fathers within services, policies, assessments and recording of fathers' information. There is that entrenched view that fathers do not belong to maternity services and are outside of the scope to record, support and manage their recovery. That stigma attached to maternal perinatal mental health um, illness and suicide um, is still rife. And then for paternal perinatal mental illness, this is absolutely higher still. Healthcare professionals are not receiving adequate training or information on how to support fathers. There's a lack of opportunities for healthcare professionals to address, assess, record or support fathers. And current data recording methods do not correlate with the length and the breadth of the impact of bereavement by suicide during the perinatal period. If I had a week, I still wouldn't be able to tell you the length and breadth of the impact that losing my partner to suicide during the perinatal period has had 
on my life, on my children's life. Um, you know, a week would not be long enough. Um, nine years this year, and I am still learning. I am still on that journey, and I will forever be on that journey. Uh, you know, uh, and that's something I, I really can't stress enough. Um, we must prevent. No father should get to the point. No, no one should get to the point. But obviously, I'm focusing here on fathers. No father should get to the point where they feel that suicide is their option because they're failing as a father, they're going to fail as a father, they're failing as a partner, they're going, you know, often they're not, but this is how they're being made to feel and that then nobody's reaching into them to activate that support. So, you know, we can start with data collection. That would be a great place to start with regards to our fathers. So I go a bit off piece there and get very passionate. Um, but our project, well, my project's aims. So um, the aims were to create dialogue amongst maternity services, policy makers, healthcare professionals, and service users, past and present. And that's why I'm so grateful to say, because, you know, we're doing that. So thank you very much for that. We want to increase training for healthcare professionals in how to support and then recognise those potential warning signs. So we need to increase training, don't we? And this was really helped to remove or at least reduce that bias and that stigma around there. So future aims which were implicated through uh, through this study. So photo voice, um, as I've seen, uh, as I uh, briefly touched on, um, despite the project's initial aims of exploring what could support fathers within maternity services with a review uh, with a view to reduce maternal suicide, it became clear that through engaging with peers during this study, that um, peer support was an important aspect that must be implicated. Um, so although we'd be bringing people together, the peer group would not be considered naturally occurring due to the recruitment process. Um, you know, there would be that process where the bereaved were encouraged to support one another. And then moving forward, there's that potential for the women to become more formal peer supporters um, and maybe gain peer support employment. So this support would then be transferable between postvention and maternity services and is in line with the NHS's long term plan. And also peer support workers are known to create a more empathetic and supportive work environment. Again, we could really start, you know, kind of uh, 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 showing how how supporting our fathers is a must um, and, and how to do that, having these women, um, you know, in, in that community there. Also, the peer support community has the potential for that long term support through the growing years as being bereaved by suicide is something that stays with you. And I think I just highlighted that. And through, you know, having that peer support community can help you through those missed moments, you know, that child's birth day um schooling relationships again you know this is not an inclusive list um, and that can be incredibly um beneficial as well and then um finally on there to increase data collection of fathers within maternity services and within suicide prevention plans Data collection needs to include parenting status um, and there is a need for father's well-being and mental health needs to be included within maternity services notes. Um, and there's that, you know, huge alarming gap in the research, specifically looking at paternal suicide during this critical perinatal period. Fathers are not being linked to children in maternity or health visiting unless, you know, they're engaging with the services. And then dads who are separated and uh, isolated from families are, you know, kind of lost in the ether there. When, and so when that suicide happens, there's no trail, there's no paper trail to collect that data about that, da um, you know, about that uh, status. Data collection methods need addressing so we can really ascertain the true scale of paternal suicides. Now, finally, I would like to finish with um, this. So within maternity services, when is a good time to talk about suicide and the potential risk factors for fathers? Even with suicide being the leading cause of maternal direct death occurring a year after birth, suicide is still such a huge taboo um, subject. 
and it's not openly discussed within maternity. So this really perpetuates that myth that pregnancy and birth is that singularly joyous occasion. And that really intensifies that self stigma for those who do not experience this. It can be said by the number of suicides that we are not yet talking about or addressing suicide in the scope that it requires to prevent. Suicide is still such a fear loaded word, but when coupled with maternity, that fear is really heightened. Healthcare professionals do not want to scare parents or take away from this joyous occasion. Um, now, of course, we do have to achieve a balance, but it can be said with certainty that we have not achieved a balance that either pre uh, prevents either maternal or paternal suicides yet. So again, when is the right time to talk about suicide within the perinatal period? It would seem that there is no right time, but conversely, there's also no wrong time. What is wrong is not to address it at all due to fear or lack of education or signposting information. So with that, I finish my presentation. I thank you very much for listening and um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.